you have your Bibles, the final chapter of 2 Samuel chapter 24. I got good news and bad news for you. The bad news is it is the final chapter of 2 Samuel. I don't, I don't know how to tell you, but it's probably one of the most wonderful book studies I have done in my life. Um, it, it has just been for me to share with you guys and just to look into the Word of God in the life of especially of David beginning in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and trying to just extract out of it all the wisdom of the Word of God in the life of a man who had a heart after God. It's just been been rich. I know I have found things I have never seen before in my life in the life of David in this, this journey. And so this is the last chapter in 2 Samuel. The good news is twofold. Next week, we're going to do a concluding study in the life of David and the two Samuels. I'm just going to do a wrap-up study, kind of condensed together. For those of you who weren't with us as far back as 1 Samuel chapter 1 or 1 Samuel chapter 16, I just want to, I just want to bring it into conclusion because the point is that David, by God's statement himself, was a man after his own heart. And I believe that you guys desire to be that. It's a high calling. It's a high bar. Um, it's not for those who are casual Christians. It is for the serious man because we've looked at the life of David. We've seen the highs and the lows. So I, I want to recapture that. The other side of the good news is we'll be going into First and Second Kings, looking at the kings of Israel. And in chapter 1, through chapter 2, verse 11, we still have David. So he's not altogether gone. He'll be a very aged old man, 69 and a half, 69 and three quarters. There'll be an attempt to usurp his throne by one of his sons, Adonijah. God has already determined that Solomon will sit on the throne. And so David will rescue that situation. And then in the first or the last 11, or first 11 verses of chapter 2, First Kings is David's passing the baton onto Solomon. For he tells his son Solomon, prove yourself for me. I like that exhortation. Prove yourself for me. So that's the good news. We'll still be in there. Tonight, chapter 24. I don't know about you, and we talked about this a little bit last week how we think of the end of our race. And for most of us in this room, we've got much more behind us than we do before us. And I don't know about you, but at my age, November will be 66. I've thought about this since I hit 60. Eternity is just a breath away, a moment away in my life. For some of you, Steve, at a time of cancer, Chris, dealing with cancer, others of you have gone through stuff battlefield warfare, perhaps if some of you have had other things happen in your life and it seems like death is right there, could be right there at any moment. You hope that when you cross the finish line of this marathon called life and your arms go up and the tape cross your chest, you hope that when you cross that line that you finish your race well. That's my hope. I don't know what you want to do at the moment of your death. I don't want to be in a hospital hooked up to machines. I don't necessarily want to be screaming in my truck going over the side of a hill. You know, there's a lot of things I would prefer not to. We always said, I don't want to be in a burning building. I don't want to drown, you know, all those kind of spooky things. <laughs> yeah, I'm all, I'm all by a bear. Wow. I'm just going to get lost in the wilderness hunting elk and never found again till the spring. I don't know. We all hope that we are going to do something virtuous, spiritual, valiant, manly. But we don't have control of that part. That's a God's hand. But you and I get to decide how we want to go out in this Christian walk, what we want that part to look like. That's a day-by-day -day thing. That's, uh, in all of us, something simply called obedience to the Lord. In a message two weeks ago, it's called making it our aim to be well-pleasing to the Lord. 
And, and that's not just, well, I'm going to decide to do that tonight, but that's I'm going to decide to do it tonight. When I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to decide again. And tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening and the next day when that circumstance arises and I'm really upset about the situation, I'm going to make it my aim to be well-pleasing. I'm going to decide to do the right thing before the Lord and not the thing that my flesh maybe wants to do. So we, we want to be able to, in that season of life, to that point of life, go out well. In studying through, especially First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, we're going to see the biographies, the biblical biographies of leaders on behalf of God and the way they go out in their life, how they perform and how they will finish the race. And David will be the standard whereby they will be measured against. I think of King Uzziah, and he's really the only one that we, we see good commentary in the Bible on, and, and Isaiah will also talk about, another king will talk about, Hezekiah, about these particular guys that were kings. Uzziah was a great military strategist. He was a weapons designer. He actually invented the multiple rocket launcher. So when you read about Uzziah, you will find out he did specifically that. He was an agronomist. He was good in the agricultural industry, helped those things. A great guy, great king. But when he grew strong, when he got to that place of, you know what, I've done well, he had something on his bucket list. He always wanted to go into the temple and offer at the altar of incense. And one day he decided to do it. The problem is if he's the king of Israel, he must be from the tribe of Judah. And if you're from the tribe of the other one, you get to work in the temple. Levi, exactly. So when he went in there and the high priest came in and said, it's not for you, Uzziah, it's not for you to offer sacrifice. And he got other priests, and they were going to haul him out. And the Lord struck him with leprosy there in the holy place. And he went, and he dwelt as a leper till the day that he died. And his son Jotham would reign concurrently with him. He would be the visible king. But Uzziah would die a leper. So he didn't go out well at the end of his life. Hezekiah also, a great king, a good king. You know, Sennacherib, the Syrian, was coming against him, and they had surrounded Jerusalem. And it was, they were trapped. And he went and he prayed before the Lord. And he, he had received a letter from the Rabshaka. And he gave the letter, said, Lord, look what they're saying right here, man. They're going to smoke us, basically, in modern vernacular. Lord, we're in big trouble. you got to do something. The Lord said, Isaiah, you go tell Hezekiah, this guy is not so much as going to shoot an arrow into Jerusalem. And that night, an angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 of the Assyrian army. They died, and Sir Necherib split. Later, he was killed by his own two sons in the house of his God. What a great victory. One day, Isaiah was told by the Lord, you go tell Hezekiah that sickness he has is unto death. He's going to die. Put his house in order. And he came and he told Hezekiah. Hezekiah went in and he wept against his bed. He wept bitterly. And he said, oh, God, I don't want to die. I want to die. Isaiah, go back. You tell him. I'm going to give him 15 more years. And to prove it, I'm going to make the shadow on the sundial of Ahaz go backwards. 10 degrees. That's like telling you, I'm going to take your cell phone, watch your phone clock, atomic time, and you will watch it go back 10 degrees in time. Ah, wow, pretty cool. The only problem is during that time, envoys from Babylon came and visited him when they had heard he was sick, heard he was healed, and he showed him the whole of the kingdom. And Isaiah came back to me and says, so what did you show these guys? He said, I showed them everything. I showed them the truth. He goes, these same guys are going to come back and take your sons captive, going to take these same treasures. It was a mistake, Hezekiah. And he even birthed a son by the name of Manasseh during that time. Manasseh was the most wicked king in the southern kingdom of Judah of all of them. Not counting the northern kingdom, that would be Ahab of Israel. But in the southern kingdom of Judah, he was the longest reigning king in the southern kingdom of Judah, 55 years. And early church writings and, and rabbinical writings say that Manasseh didn't like Hezekiah, uh, Isaiah the prophet so much that he stuck him in a hollowed out log and then he got some guys and they sawed the log in half with Isaiah in it. 
So for Hezekiah, at the end, he, he didn't do well. David, in our study tonight, doesn't get to go out the way we wish he would. In fact, we're, he's going to commit in our study tonight his greatest sin, his most costliest sin. When we think of David and we think of sin, the first thing that comes to your mind is always Bathsheba. And then sometimes when you think it out, you realize there was a more significant sin that he committed. It was Uriah. We just think of adultery Bathsheba. But when you look at what God says and you look at everything in the Bible, God was not happy with the Bathsheba thing, but what really cost David was the fact that he went and he killed a man and the men in his company to cover up this sin, to keep it secret. And God said, what you did in secret, I will expose you to the world. And the sword will never leave your own house. And I will raise up an adversary in your house, and he will fight against you. But the reality is, Uriah died. Men in Uriah's company died. But what we'll see here tonight is 70,000 people will die because of David's sin. So I don't know about you, when I quantify sin and I look at collateral damage, if you will, I would say tonight's sin is the greatest, but the least really mentioned in the life of David. I just find that interesting how we take sins and we, we throw them out. We say, oh, David, Bathsheba, worst thing ever. That certainly to be true. David and Uriah, oh, worse yet. But David and what he does tonight, is really the worst of all. When you consider 70,000 people died, how many families were affected in those 70,000 people, and how many generations would be affected thereafter in, in, in this sin of David? It's, it, it's, it's pretty huge, pretty big. So uh, we look at this tonight and just go, wow, this, this is not the way I want to go out. And there have been others, there will be others, but just for us, brothers, just to be mindful in your life with whatever maybe is even coming into your mind, that when you go out, you want to go out with this anticipation of hearing from the Lord when you breathe your last and you enter into eternity before the Lord, that he says, well done, faithful servant. Not glad to see it, glad you barely made it just by my grace. It may not matter to you. I know for me, when I get there, I'm just going to be glad to be in the multitude of the heavenly group in heaven. I don't expect to be out front, up front. I don't expect the Lord to make any. I'm just going to be glad to be in the group. But I want to be in the group where the Lord can say, that's the way I wanted you to go out. That's the way I wanted you to enter into heaven. You know, if you had one hour of life left, let's say, and you knew that you had an hour, and you knew you didn't have things in line, and you weren't ready to see the Lord. I think of people, and you'll hear them once in a while, I'm not ready to die yet, and you wonder, what does that mean? What does that mean, I'm not ready to die yet? We're all going to die. The only thing that really, you know, you, you think of your wife, you don't want to leave her behind, you think of what she has to do, and as men, I hope and pray we've done as much as we can in the anticipation in the day that it does happen, that she's as prepared and ready as possible. I sometimes think I would rather have her go because I've done too many funerals, and the vast majority of the funerals that I have done have been for the husband, not the wife. And now there's a wife left behind. And I just feel for that poor gal. I just, I just think, man, what a tough life to live without her head, without her husband, without the one who has done so much and taken care of her to, to be on her own. So it's a little bit easier. Well, I can't use the word easier. I retract the word easier back. It's just a little bit, for me anyways, in my mind. What do you think, Dave? You're a widower. You know, leaving your bride would be difficult, and I know your bride leaving you has been tough. If you had a choice, which way would you go? The way it went, brother. Thank you, man. There's a man right there who could testify to that. So I just think if we had an hour left, hopefully we can say, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm excited to go. Lord, here I come. And not, oh, my gosh, Lord, I did this. I did that. Oh my, will I be accepted? Will you know, does grace really cover this? We don't want to be doing that. So finish your race well, brother. 
Raise your arms high when the tape covers your chest. If you should go before we go, at your memorial celebration of life, we want to be able to stand up as brothers from the Monday night group and go, well done, brother, well done, well done, brother, well done. We'll see you soon, man. How exciting. Verse 1, chapter 24. Again the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go and number Israel and Judah. The Lord's anger is aroused again. Perhaps the first time might have been chapter 21 when he had to deal with a national issue that dated all the way back to the reign of Saul and how they treated the Gibeonites. Perhaps that's what the writer here, either Nathan or Gad, is, is letting us know that the Lord was angry with Israel and now he wants to deal with something. We're going to find that he is angry with them, but he's going to allow circumstances here to, to bring about his discipline. And it's one of those areas where we as students of the word have to really begin to look very broadly at the workings of the Lord and what he does. It tells us, that he moved David to number Israel. If you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 21, which is the parallel account written by Samuel, Nathan, and Gad, it says that Satan moved David to number Israel. And therein is one of the places where the skeptic of the Word of God loves to stand up and say, see, your Bible doesn't even make sense. It lies against itself. Here we see it's the Lord that moved him. Scholars suggest here that when you see that the Lord was angry with Israel and he moved David, that the H in Hebrew, Hebrews don't capitalize like English does. We capitalize H's when we believe it's the Lord. So in your New King James and others, the H is capitalized. They suggest the possibility there that the H shouldn't be capitalized, that the Lord was angry, but that the he would correlate with First Chronicles 21.1 that he would be Satan moved David to number Israel. Um, Satan is always standing up against Israel, and you see that in 1 Chronicles 21. He, he stood up against them. Satan is always standing up against believers. Revelation 12 says he's an accuser of the brethren. He accuses you and me day and night. He stands up against us. Zechariah tells us he stood up against Joshua, the high priest, in the garden, he stood up against Adam when he came to Eve that he might cause man to fall against sin. So he does stand up against us all the time. Against Job, when he was going to and fro, and he had, fro, he had given a count before the Lord. And the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? He stood up against and said, he only likes you because you bless him. He only likes you because you haven't touched him yet. So Satan is always standing up against us and we see in job that the lord allows satan to do things sometimes to accomplish god's will in the long run so it's my belief when we see the two accounts of the numbering of israel is the lord is angry and he allows satan to stand against israel and to influence david to count the people because the Lord is both going to be dealing in the life of David but remember it says he was angry with Israel for a reason and we're not told exactly what the reason is and don't be upset because God doesn't have to explain to you why he does what he does when he does it that's what makes him God the boss you should know better if you're a dad there are times when you discipline your children tell them to do something give them an order and you don't have to explain the why it's just the answer is because I'm dad and I think it's the right thing to do. Now, we'll get the job done. So it's very probable when you look at the two, it's not a conflict, but rather it's just the way both narratives bring about something. And in the long run, we're going to see the Lord's going to do something and he has a plan in mind. So it moves us, verse 2. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, now, go throughout all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba. Count the people that I may know the number of the people. And Joab said to the king, 
Now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times more than there are, and may the eyes of my Lord the King see it. But why does the Lord my uh, why does my Lord the King desire this thing? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the army. Therefore, Joab and the captains of the army went out from the presence of the king to count the people of Israel. So he's commanding Joab to do it. No doubt that means it's going to be a count of the military forces, not just a census of the population of the people, but it's going to be take a count. Let's find out how many soldiers that we have and are available for service, perhaps maybe thinking that there's going to be some sort of a very near conflict arising with somebody else. He also knows that Solomon, his son, will soon be king. Perhaps he wants to have some sort of account there for that reason. Remember, there were some recent struggles internally. Remember when Sheba says, what do we have to do with you, O house of David? Every man to his tent and the nation was kind of ripped. Earlier, his son Absalom became king, and Israel sided with Absalom, and so David had the nation against him. So perhaps maybe he wants to know who's really on my side. Or perhaps what seems to be in the end, David is putting his trust in military might in numbers of soldiers. He's looking to see how big is my army, how strong am I, and, and he's putting his trust there. This would go against something that David had written and many things that David had written. But in Psalm 20, verse 7, David wrote, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So David had learned through his life his faith was in the Lord, not in military power, armament, those kinds of things that were trusting the Lord. Interesting, Joab's response to David. May God bless you with a hundred times more. Hope you see it. Why do you want this thing? Why do you want to do this? This makes me feel by Joab's response that it's more out of a, a pride thing on David's part. Joab can see what you're doing is not good. It doesn't fit in with who we are as God's people. So why would you want to do it? I think if it was... Out of a real military necessity or, or a real war, Joab probably would have approved of it. He probably would have thought, well, I want to know how many men I'm taking into battle too, whether or not we're ready to, to go against this nation. But even Joab's against it. And if Joab's against it, and Joab rarely gets it right, you, you got to listen. You got to wonder, Dave, what, do you, what are you doing? And so Joab says, man, counting the people, boss, this is wrong. Why do you desire this? You know, and you wonder what other conversation may have come up in this discussion that the writer of Second Samuel did not pin down because it wasn't necessary to the narrative. I'm one who believes that when you read something, not everything is there because I think we tend to be people who look sometimes at the narrative, and if the narrative didn't fit my situation, then that's not really for me. Well, I know the Bible says right there that that guy was told he shouldn't do that, but my situation is different because I read his situation, and his situation looked like this, but my situation, well, it's different. And I think we make a mistake in thinking somehow we get into the details and think my situation's different. That's why I, I believe, that's me, when God gives some command sometimes, it's a simple command, and it, and it fits everybody. All of us are told, don't do this do this. Because if he got into the details, there'd be plenty of people who'd want to go, well, my situation doesn't fit it. I'm looking at the details, so that command doesn't apply to me. Therefore, I don't have to obey that command. And I think we're moving away from what I call simple obedience. God's word is not that complex, and the vast majority of his commands are pretty much simple. If we're honest with ourselves, we pretty much know what God's telling us to do. And he just simply wants you and me to obey him. But it's human nature to begin to try to take it and work this thing like the proverbial Rubik's Cube to make sure you get all the colors in the places where when you get done with it, it, it I don't have to have to obey that. So it, it's, you know, it's a simple, quick conversation. Why do you want to do this? 
And the captains of the army were with him. They also are against the census. So now you got a, a growing group of guys who are against David. But David said, nevertheless, man, I, you, you got to go. It's a command, Joab. It's not a suggestion. I'm not asking for your counsel. I don't care what the whole, you know, military thinks, all the commissioned officers. It doesn't matter. Go. Count them. I want you to count them. And David prevailed. Sometimes when we prevail, it's to our own hurt, huh? I'm going to get my way, and we get our way. And then later on, we're sorry we got our way. So in this circumstance, we see David prevailing. Verse 5, they crossed over the Jordan. They camped in Arar on the right side of the town, which is in the midst of the ravine of Gad, and toward Jazer. Then they came to Gilead and to the land of Tatim Hadshi. They came to Dan Jain and around to Sidon. They came to the stronghold of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites. Then they went out to the south, Judah, as far as Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to the king. And there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000 men. So they start eastward from Jerusalem. They go down from Jerusalem eastward. They cross the Jordan. They go into what's known as Gilead. They count there. They begin to move north and then northwest up into Tyre near the coast in the northern part of Israel. When they get down there, they work their way all the way to the south to Beersheba. Whenever you hear something that says from Dan to Beersheba, Dan is the farthest most city. Beersheba is the southern city in the main part of the nation. It's not the tribe of Dan when they say Dan. It's what is known today as Tal Dan or the hill of Dan. If you go to Israel, part of the tour will be up to Tal Dan where there's a Canaanite temple and stuff like that up in the far north. So he says from the north to the south. I, I, but the idea is everything. You know, you could say from coast to coast. I want something done. I want it done from coast to coast in the United States. That means you're encompassing basically the whole of the nation. So it takes almost 10 months to get this done. Quite a project. 1.3 million men ready for war. Quite, quite a military. When you read First Chronicles chapter 21, it gives us more information. It says he did not count the Levites, neither did he count the tribe of Benjamin. Now, the Levites were okay because in Numbers, chapter 1 and chapter 2, you weren't supposed to number them with the men of war. Their job was the ministry, not war. But he omitted Benjamin. It's my opinion because Chronicles says that the word of David was an abomination to Joab. Imagine that. He didn't count them. Either he figured if I omit them in the count, it won't get us in trouble with God somehow. Or he omitted them because he did it out of spite toward David. He didn't listen to me. I told him he shouldn't do it. His word was abominable. I'm not counting everybody. So he, he left those two tribes out. One he should have left out. The other one he should have included, but he didn't do it. Then verse 10. And David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. So 10 months to think about what he did. Very similar time frame after Bathsheba, the killing of Uriah, the baby finally is born. David had 10 to 12 months also after that incident to think about what he had done. David had always learned to trust the Lord in every situation. And now when he looks back, the count has been made. The numbers are brought in. David is thinking about it. Now he realized it was a foolish decision, that it was wrong. He had known the Lord to deliver him, and he even said that when we looked at that psalm that he had written earlier, that the Lord had delivered him from every circumstance. And there was no reason here to doubt the Lord, especially in the later times of life. Every victory in your life, every time the Lord answers your prayer, brothers, and I've said to you before, sometimes you need to write those notes in your Bible. And in the old days when they used to print Bibles, you always had like five or six blank pages on the back and some in the front of your Bible. The intention was you were note takers. 
and it's a great place to, to write down the notes. But in your mind, always remember, every time the Lord does something, you say, man, the Lord really took care of me that time. The Lord answered my prayer. Man, the Lord rescued me. That all goes into your spiritual library for you to go back to, to refer back to. Next time you get into a bad situation, God wants you to remember what he has done for you in the past. And the older that you, I, we get, the more information we should have stored up in that library to go back and reference. It should look like a lawyer's library. Ever seen case law and lawyers? And they got these volumes and volumes of case law where they can go back and revert to a court case and, and how it came out, and that's what they will do. Well, you know, back in 1992 you know, in this court case, Johnson versus State, and they'll go back there and use that. It's the same way with you. When doubt comes, you have to be the lawyer of faith and go back and say, wait a minute, but the Lord did this, and the Lord did that, and the Lord's promise for this, and the Lord said that. And so the Lord can work again. We see here in this place that David's heart condemned him, that David is a man of conscience. A man of conscience. God has given every one of us a faculty called the conscience. It's one of those things that argues greatly against the false theory of evolution. The conscience is non-physical. Evolution is strictly physical. Evolution could have never evolved in you a conscience. God put conscience in people. It's the place he convicts every person of right and wrong. The conscience either accuses us, the Bible says, or excuses us. And that's what the conscience is there for. You are to make God shape your conscience so that you have a very sensitive conscience to God. Or you can let the devil shape your conscience, and you will have what the Bible calls a seared conscience. It's like burnt flesh. It's like the callus on your palm when you do a lot of labor. Remember in school, if you had the ability to get a good callus, you could stick a pen through it, a straight pen, and freak the girls out. But it's all dead skin. There's no nerve endings in there. It feels nothing. But our conscience is supposed to be sensitive. In the Bathsheba Uriah circumstance, David's conscience was suppressed. And he thought he had made it through until the Lord came and exposed it. Now David's conscience is far more sensitive. And he realizes that, that what he has done is wrong. So when he got the count, he may have started out with, what a great and formidable army I built. But as the conscience spoke to him, it was more like, what am I thinking? Am I crazy or what? You know, and so suddenly personal conviction works in. This time it didn't take a prophet Nathan to come to him and give him a little story about a little sheep and for him to finally bust David. David didn't need that. This time David himself had a conscience. In the Bathsheba Uriah circumstance, it did. It tells us that a man after God's own heart is a man who has a heart that God can speak to that God can speak directly to your heart, either accuse you or excuse you of something, and you will feel the conviction in your heart. It's what the Holy Spirit does. He convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so you and I have to be men who allow our conscience to be developed by the Word of God. It will tell us what is right and what is wrong. And when we hit a bad note, when we do a wrong action, the Holy Spirit will quickly defer to that command and we will feel conviction quickly and we will feel the guilt of sin and we'll go before the Lord and do what we need to do to make it right. So we see in David's life, this is what's going on, this is what's getting better. Verse 11 says, Now when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad. David's here saying, go and tell David, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and he said to him, shall seven years of famine come to your land? Shall you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days plague in your land? Now consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. 
It tells us that Gad was David's seer, and the Bible says a seer, a prophet was a seer. And it's a seer. He, he's one who sees. He's a seer. I see things you can't see, and now let me tell you, as God would speak to him. So a seer is simply a prophet. Gad was David's prophet. We saw him, first of all, in 1 Samuel 22, when David was at the cave of Adullam. Gad came to him and said, David, you need to get out of here. It's not a safe place to stay anymore. And so David went to the forest of Hereth. He got out of there. We see Gad come back a second time as a prophet. And God has spoken to this man, Gad, who has been with David. I believe he was with David during his fugitive years and no doubt was a voice of the Lord to David. And now he comes in, and God has sent him to David. And he says, I'm going to bring chastisement against David. You tell David he has three choices. Wow. Another prophet now. Now, now conviction came to David. And, and God's probably not going to send you or me a prophet to tell us what we did wrong, but he will send the Holy Spirit. So here he's not sending God to tell David what he did wrong. David has asked God to put his iniquity away and what he has done. But when Nathan came to David there in chapter 12, verse 13, Nathan said to David, your sin has been put away from you. you shall not die. And then he went on to list the things that David would suffer as a consequence of his sin. So David has prayed to God, and I believe God has forgiven David. However, the consequence of David's sin now is coming through the voice of the prophet Gad, and he gives David three choices. I want to say uh, 1 Chronicles 21.7 says that God was displeased with this thing. 11.27 in 2 Samuel, at the end of the situation, it tells us those ten ominous words. But the thing that David has done has displeased the Lord. Again, God is displeased with David. Again, we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him. David hasn't been well-pleasing, so the Lord says you got three options for your sin. God doesn't give you and me options. Gil, you blew it. I forgive you. However, what you have sown you will reap. Here's your three choices. Pick one of the three. We don't get those options. David is getting him. Seven years of famine. That'd be something David was familiar with. He just had one back in chapter 21. How about three months of being a fugitive again? Second Samuel 15, he had to get out of Jerusalem. Absalom was coming in. He knew that would Saul. Or three days of a plague in Israel. Which are the three? As David thought about it, he quickly said, I'd rather be in the hand if the plague is going to come from God then I'd rather let God do what God is going to do. I don't trust man. David has known what men could be like in Saul, in Absalom, in Sheba. And so he just trusts in the Lord. Seven years of famine, First Chronicles says three. That's a long famine. So David chooses the last one. If the Lord came to you and said, here's your three choices for your sin and gave all three of them to you, you'd probably say, do I get a fourth? You ever had a situation where you have to fix something you did, and when you think about the several ways to do it, every choice is an ugly choice. This ain't going to be good no matter what road I take. And that's what David is probably thinking. He probably saw him, the prophet, the seer, when he came and he said, Egad. Maybe that's where that term came from. You ever heard somebody go, Egad? Well, yeah, Egad, you know. Those are lousy three choices. Gad, it's one of the three. And so he trusts in the Lord because God is a God of mercy. So judgment is coming, but David is hoping on the mercy of God. Habakkuk, the prophet, was told that the Babylonians were going to come and wipe out God's people. And Habakkuk first said, wait a minute, you can't do that. You're a righteous God. Them guys are the most wicked dudes in the neighborhood. you got to be kidding me. And he, a couple chapters goes on, and he says, well, now I'm just going to sit back and wait for God to come and rebuke me. And when God tells him what he's going to do, he says this in chapter 3. He said, God, in wrath, against his people, remember mercy. That was his prayer. Four words. In wrath, remember mercy. Throughout the Bible, God's people always know that God is a God in mercy. Paul said Ephesians chapter 2, but God who is rich in mercy with the love wherewith he has loved us, for by grace are you saved. God is rich. He is a merciful God. 
It's why he sent Jesus, because he wanted to show humanity mercy. He loved humanity, wants to show mercy, and for those who will receive it, will receive grace. Three beautiful attributes of God, love, mercy, and grace. And so that's what David is looking to. God chastens us, his children, because he loves us. And he gives us less than we deserve. When I think back of the spankings and the whippings I got from my dad as a young man, I got so many fewer than I certainly deserved in life. But God is a God of mercy to us. So verse 15 says, The Lord sent a plague upon Israel. Notice, not just David, but Israel. From the morning till the appointed time, from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people died. When the angel stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, It is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. So the Lord's anger initially is against Israel. David is moved to number them. He does. David gets in trouble for what he has done as the king. But again, God's anger was against the nation of Israel. So, so here goes the plague that David chose from north to south. 70,000 people have died. What the plague was, we don't know. What, the, what, what God inflicted them, we don't know what it was. So we know that 70,000 died. Perhaps the 70,000 may have been military men. You trust in your military, and suddenly your soldiers start dying? I don't know. I'm just guessing. That certainly speak volumes to you. You'd know that God was hitting right at the place where you were putting your trust and your faith, and now they're dying. The angel of the Lord is, is killing it. He's, he's gone to the north. He's come to the south. And now it seems like the only place left is to circle back to Jerusalem and hit the capital. And when he gets there, God says, stop. Stop right there. It hasn't fallen on Jerusalem yet. And he stops at the threshing floor of Arana because we're going to see God is wanting a sacrifice for the atonement of sin to happen initially. But he's got a, a much bigger picture. God, when he does stuff, I find out, is multitasking quite often. The trial in your life sometimes has an immediate lesson, but you'll probably find out looking back there were other things in it that he was doing also. He had more in mind in the circumstance than you imagine. And, and he's like that. God is like that when he does certain things, and that's what he's doing right here uh, as the plague comes. So quite interesting. You stop the angel. And I want you to note that what God does with men when he chastens them varies sometimes. I think we look in the Bible, sometimes we go, wow, that was just too much, Lord. Or, boy, you let that guy have a break. You did show him mercy. So I, I don't find a scale of chasing by the God in the Bible that I can write down and say, well, here's level one if you really blow it. This is what you can expect. Level two will be this. This is what you can expect. Level three will be this if this I find times, again, it's Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit, didn't fork over all the money, and the Lord decides he's going to use them as an example of the church of lying to God. I think I pretty much qualified far more than Ananias and Sapphira in my life for the same judgment. They should have carried me out of the kingdom of God. I got 44 years in Jesus. I should have at least made it one month. I find plenty of reasons why, but he doesn't. And, and you can go throughout the Bible, and God sees and judges and measures by a different standard than you and I are doing. He has more information. He has purposes. And he has things that he's doing in lives to make points about life. And so don't ever think that somehow there's this biblical scale that you can create through the Bible, and that guy didn't get it, and God wasn't fair because that guy should have got whacked and that guy shouldn't have. That makes you God. That makes you wiser than God, and you know more than God knows. Don't go there. You don't want to be that person. I just learned in my life, God has a better perspective. He has a greater plan. And if he said it, he said it didn't he? I will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy, and I will be compassionate to whom I will be compassionate. You want to argue with me on that point? If 
Paul says, who are you to contend with God? It, that's a God thing, not a man thing. Just cry out for mercy on your own behalf for those that you love, and if you get that, you're blessed. So David, in verse 17, intercedes for the people. David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people, and he said, Surely I have sinned, I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. So David is given a vision of the angel as he's coming to Jerusalem. He gets a spiritual insight, or the angel is made physical to be viewed. In the Bible, we know angels are spirits, but we also know they can materialize and take on physical, tangible form. We know they can be touched. We know they can eat. We think of Abraham when, when, when he was there just hanging out. And the Lord and two angels came and, as visitors. They cooked a meal and they ate. The two angels went on to Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord stayed and communed with Abraham. Lot down in Sodom and Gomorrah was told to leave. At one point, the angels actually had to grab him by the hand and pull him out of there physical, tangible, brought him out. In Acts 12, Peter was in jail. Peter was good at sleeping in crisis moments. He slept in the garden when Jesus said, pray with me for an hour. But when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was in jail, going to be killed, sentenced to death. He nodded out. It says that the angel had to strike Peter on the side to wake him up. I love the humor in the Bible on that one. The angel did not speak to Peter, or he did speak. Peter didn't wake up, and it says, and he struck him on the side to wake him up. All right, Pete. So that they, they do do that. And so one way or another, he sees the angel. Adam and Eve saw an angel in the garden at the tree of life with a flaming sword. No longer could they eat of that fruit any longer because they'd eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So at times, angels are seen. And David accepts the full liability for his sin. And like a shepherd, he sees the people as sheep. And his heart's breaking that the sheep are suffering for his sin. So he intercedes with the Lord. And the response of Gad back to David, verse 18. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aranah, the Jebusite. So David, this is a great verse. David did according to the word of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. Now Arana looked and he saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So Arana went out and he bowed before the king with his face to the ground. And Arana said, why is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you, to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Now Arana said to David, let my lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look, here are oxen for burnt sacrifice, threshing implements, and the yokes of the oxen for wood. All these, O king, Arana has given to the king. And Arana said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. So as David was told, the angel stopped at his threshing floor. He said, you go and, and, and you buy that, and then you erect an altar. There's going to be a sacrifice there, atonement for your sin. David is coming, Arana sees him coming, and he's going to give everything to him. A threshing floor is basically where they would take the harvested grain, they would bring it there, they would work the grain to get the husk off the grain. Once they did that, they would put them in these flat kind of baskets. You remember back in the 90s, your, wall, your wives probably had a couple of them on the wall. I'd seen them around, and they would put the grain with the chaff, usually near kind of a cliff kind of thing where the, the warm air, the current would come up, and the gals could do this stuff really good, and they would throw it in the air, and the wind would blow away the chaff, and the weight of the grain would bring it down to the basket. That's a threshing floor. And so that's what Arana has. That's what David is buying, this whole area right there. And Arana said, you can have the threshing floor. You can have the oxen for the sacrifice if you need to burn them. The, the implements, the scythes, and, and all these things, the yoke, everything's yours, boss. And then he blessed David, and he said, may the Lord your God accept you. May this sacrifice be received by God. That really is a blessing from him. Then the king said to Arana, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord, my God, with that which costs me nothing. Wow. So David bought the threshing floor, notice this, and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. 
and that David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land, and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. He offers it to him, but David says no. David is not going to let another man pay for his own sin. He's going to pay for it himself. And I think that's the way we ought to be in our own walk, that we pay for it. It's going to cost you something in your walk. Jesus said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? He lets you know it's going to cost you something to be a believer. It's going to be costly continually. You're not paying for salvation. You're paying for the privilege to be his disciple. It's going to cost you something. He who has a walk that with God that costs him nothing has a walk with God that is worth let me read you what a, a, a great, you'll, you'll recognize this one, poem. It's called, Has Thou No Scar? No hidden scar on foot or side or hand. I hear thee sung is mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Has thou no scar? Has thou no wound? Yet I was wounded by the archer spent. Lean me against a tree to die and rent. By ravening beasts that compass me, I swoon. Hast thou no wound? No wound, no scar? Yet as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me. But thine are whole. Can, have, can he have followed far who has no wound, no scar? Love that. No wounds, no scars, huh? Keeping it safe. Don't want to get hurt. But a believer will have wounds and scars on Jesus' behalf because Jesus has wounds and scars on our behalf. And so David says, it's going to cost me. It's going to come out of me. So David would buy Arana's threshing floor on a place called Mount Moriah. Genesis 22, Abraham will be told to take thy son, thy only son whom you love, to a mountain in the land of Moriah that I will show you, and there you will sacrifice him to me. It'll take three days to get there. But Abraham already decided that God would raise his son from the dead. Do you see a picture there? He brought his son there, put him on the altar, and he brought his hand up to slay his son, and the Lord spoke to him from heaven and stayed the hand, just like he stayed the hand of the angel. David would buy the threshing floor where the temple would be built, for it is here that God said the temple should be built. David's first sin with Bathsheba would le later yield a son that four chapters earlier was prophesied would come. Now that one will really throw you in kind of a, you know, you like everything to be nice and linear with when God does something. But why does he four chapters earlier prophesy a son who was born out of an adulterous, murderous relationship? He's the guy who's going to build the temple. David wanted to build it. Nathan said, God said, no, but he'll build you a house. And your son, I will never remove my mercy from him. He will build the temple. Solomon. And Solomon will have 700 wives and 300 concubines. He will set up temples for those wives who will sway his heart away from the Lord on the Mount of Abomination, and yet he would be the man who would build the temple. Amazing, amazing. So be careful that when you say everything should just lined up real systematically, real straight, neat, and even. And, and when God operates, he does things in, I find, very exciting, interesting ways. And so, so here's David's sin of numbering the people, 70,000 die, but God already has in mind not only to show David mercy, not only to deal with the nation he was angry with, but we're also going to buy the real estate that later on is going to be the place where the temple would be built. And God says, and I will put my name right there. So, again, God is multifaceted when he does stuff. He's, he's got a bigger plan than you and me. So God used a man like David to birth the son to build his temple. And God uses men like you and me to put his Holy Spirit in to give his word and make us to tell the world about the son that died for our sin. Romans 5.20 says, where sin abounds, and you could put in parentheses, like me in my life it does, grace abounds much more. That's the grace of God working in the life of a man.